Um, next up is Julian OS, and he's going to present the three hidden tricks for PX4 Zero. Um, Julian is a senior software engineer for Altherian. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you, yeah. So I'm generally working on, on PX4 and um, MEV SDK. And today I just have like a hands on session that hopefully any, everyone here in the room can take something away from. Um, sort of uncovering some hidden things that are actually in the dev guide about SIDL, but might not be might not be that you might not be familiar with. I'm going to start off with a picture of me in uh, in Switzerland. Point being, I like the outdoors. Um, I like flying drones as well, but at work every now and then I also need to sit down and because I'm lazy and I want to sit down and I don't want to go outside. And of course, there is the reason that development speed is faster if you can do it in simulation right there on your machine and, and safer as well, because you can crash many times. Um, before I go into the SIDL tricks, um, I think most of you are probably familiar with SIDL. Just wanted to take a small step back and, and explain what it is. So software in the loop simulation, you have everything running on your local computer. Um, the simulator on one side, that's generally JMAFSIM or Gazebo for sort of the common PX4 case, um, which publishes, which simulates the world and publishes sensor values essentially, um, sends that to PX4. PX4 does all of its calculations and what it wants to do in that world. And the output at the end is actuator outputs, so motors and servos, and that gets fed back into the simulator that then does sort of the physics, does a, another step. Um, so now um, that's sort of the three um, tricks that I want to get into before I go into those. Um, I don't know who in the room has heard of you know, that lockstep thing for SIDL. Okay. Um, what about shell scripting for SIDL? Yes, I thought that. Um, the, yeah, what about debugging GDB with GDB val grind or call grind? Okay. Cool, thanks. Um, let's go lockstep first. So, common problems we've seen with SIDL in the last years were sort of the CPU load being too high. Let's say you also do, do some physics simulation, not phys you do some 3D simulation next to it, um, or you have your browser open and it does some things. And suddenly you have either PX4 missing samples or you have gazebo missing samples and they're sort of out of sync or, or struggle to keep up. And yeah, a common thing that you see is this you know, timeout, the sensor value missed sort of cryptic, but what it usually meant is something can't keep up and, and you're losing samples. Um, and then if those samples sort of go on over, over too long, then you can get like, sort of like an interruption and, and it can lead to a crash if you're unlucky. So how, how could we improve that? So how does lockstep work? Basically, the simulator and PIX4 now run in lockstep. And what that means is that the simulator sets the time, so it, it sends sensor values, including a timestamp. And that timestamp then drives PX4. So if no t new timestamp is coming, PX4 doesn't do anything. It basically is stuck waiting on the time it progressing. Once PX4 sends a new actuator output back to, for instance, Gazebo, um, then the simulator does another step. So they both wait on each other. Um, sort of one, one sample goes, goes round and round. Um, why should you use it? So I'm, I'm saying that because it's in 1.9 and I really think it's important. So I'm, I'm asking the question, why should I use lockstep? And, and so as already mentioned, CPU usage is too high. Um, with lockstep, you're fine. You can run this on some old computer. Not sure about that one. You can now pause. Um, it might have worked before, but right now you're sure that nothing will advance while you inspect what's going on, while you use, um, while you do your debugging. 
And what we figured is by sort of abstracting the time, there is a bonus to that. You can now run the simulation faster or slower than real time. There we go. Okay, so how to pause, that one's easy. In Gazebo, you've got a, a button. And in JMFSIM, you can press P and it stops, and P again, and off you go. How can you speed it up? This is an environment variable, so it's called px4sim speed factor. So a factor of 10 means it's going to run up to 10x the time, um, depending on your machine. So oftentimes, I just put in 20 and then my desktop might do 15x, my laptop here might do 5x. And then you do your, your normal make. Now, Daniel has been working on sort of better VS Code integration. Um, and in there, you can do the same thing. Um, we just got that merged recently, and it's this, um, the same environment variable, basically, that you set in, a, in this tasks.json file. So... See if we can demo this. We got QGC with a mission loaded. Now I'm just going to set the speed to 20, as I said. Go as fast as possible. And we're going to use the standard VTOL. Okay. Um, where's my upload button? Here it is. Okay. Start that mission. Let's zoom out a bit here. So we're trying to fly from ETH, where we are right now, over to the Oterion headquarters um, along Limat, the, the river. And then, so this is the standard VTOL. And it's going at 16 meters per second, but then if you look at the real-time factor in gazebo, right now it's three, yeah, three to four, so what we can get on, on this machine. Um, as I said, up to about 15 on a desktop. I'm sure there is room for improvement. If you find anything, let me know. Um, the model's still there, it's just our camera's not. There it is. Okay, we're there. Now we're just going to descend. Right, and we just covered, just wanted to check how far that was. Uh, never mind, I believe it was about three kilometers that we did in this short time. Cool, let's go back. So, number two. Shell scripting. So you're probably familiar with the not shell, and so the shell scripting and in it uh, startup on on Notix. Um, so it's a great way to sort of interact with the system, to run your custom command, to figure out what can the command even do, or or to use it at, as debugging using top free these sorts of tools. And turns out we actually have not quite the same, but a very, very similar um, system on for SIDL or for, for built on POSIX. And all you have to do is add the bin folder in your, of your um, build directory to your path. And if you look at the LS output, you can see that there is a whole bunch of aliases, sorry, symlinks to PX4 with that, those names. And so that mimics using, using um, the PX4 modules as sort of executables when actually then they then get run against the PX4 actual process and just spawning a thread. Um, looks like I have to demo this. So that's not the one. Let's go here. Okay. So the, what I want to show is I'm just going to run jmfsim for this. Okay, that's the wrong one. jmfsim. Okay. 
And now I want to interact in the same way as in the not shell. Just need to go into my firmware di directory and I need to add the path uh, as I showed before. So uh, export path down. And I have now, if all goes well, let me do that without the speed up so it's a bit easier to see. Okay. Commander, take off. Oh, I was too early. Yeah. I've seen that one before. There we go. Cool. And just to show the pause thing from before. So I can just go pause and can continue again. And now I want to do some inspections. So I'm going to do URP top. So in this case, PX4 URP top. And I nicely, in another terminal, I can sort of look at this diagnostic. And I can do the same thing again. Just need to add the path again. And I can do something like PX4 listener. Let's look at sensor combined a thousand times and I get the listener right in some terminal and I can leave that running, I can grab in there, I can just sort of have more things to, to debug what's going on. So that's shell scripting. We have seen that. Um, third one, debugging with GDB, well grind and call grind. I'm not going to cover like how to do GDB all grind, all cold grind. I'm just going to sort of quickly say how that's actually quite easily doable with PX4. Um, all you have to do is do underscore the model, so iris or plane, and GDB. That, that's as easy as it is. And thanks to Daniel's recent work with VS Code, it's even possible out of, out of VS Code. Um, let's see where my... No, no, neither. Here's VS Code. Um, there will be documentation on the VS Code usage. That's, that's um, work in progress. Just going to make sure that my targets down here are correct. Then I'm clicking on the debug symbol here. And all I have to do is press play and hope for the best. Okay, so that's as usual, so I can do commander takeoff. No, I can't as usual. Um, anyway, while we're waiting, I can show you here that all the threads are running. Um, some of them are nicely named and I can press pause and I can go into sensors and I can check what's actually going on over there. Uh, ignore that one. So in this case, it's waiting on, on the semaphore. It's waiting because lockstep gives it the next timestamp. And so many um, threads are, tend to be waiting on the next time. So anyway, on that, I can just play, press play. And you've seen that also the local variables were shown. It's just how you would expect it in an IDE. Um, breakpoints should work as well. Let me try to demo that. So commander demo, boom, and we landed right in here where I set a breakpoint. So welcome to the summit. Yep. Again, that's what you were seeing. Um, memory detection, memory error detection using Valgrind. Um, so Valgrind is a great tool to so find uninitialized memory, especially at the point when it's used. Um, find memory leaks, uh, and, and, and much it's much more uh, powerful than that, but that's just sort of the, the basics it can cover. I, I suggest you look at the docs and, and 
um, resort to it if, if you need it. Again, the usage is actually with PX4 is easy. Just your model underscore Valgrind, that's it. And what you get is a lot of um, a lot of verbose output like this. And all this tells you is that some socket call, so you're using data in a socket call that you're sending somewhere, for instance, points to uninitialized bytes. And then it gives you all of the information that might help you in finding where this uninitialized value was initially created, in this case, some EKF function. Um, just as an example, what, what you might expect from Valgrind. Profiling using Colgrind. Um, Colgrind is a tool on top of Valgrind, um, and it gives you profiling. So function, function call graphs, function call counts, time spent in the functions, and much, much more. So, so whatever you might need to, to profile um, what's going on. And so you can, in my opinion, do a lot of profiling before having to go onto the target, having to go onto the PixHawk and, and figure it out there. Um, what happens is that you get a dump, a call grind.out file at the end of the simulation. And you can then use or inspect that data in a tool like kcashgrind is what I like. Um, if we zoom in on the picture here, for instance, that's uh, just a, a quick SIDL run that I did, and I figured more or less that EKF is about using 20% of the CPU time um, without further inspecting that, but it seems, about in, it seems about in the order that we would expect. And then you can sort of zoom in on all of these functions um, looking for whatever information we you need. So, okay, what now? Um, <laughs> I hope I could give you some ideas, some tools in the back of your mind that next time when, you, when you're debugging something, you might resort to. And, and it's all in the dev guide, except the VS code that's, that's ramping up. Um, so just now you have the keywords, look for that, and I'm sure you can find something helpful. And yeah, thank you for your attention. Wow, who knew the bugging could be so fun? <laughs> Any questions for Julian? Yep. Sorry for asking. <laughs> oh, go ahead. First of all, I want your bash prompt. How can I get your bash prompt? <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> so seashell with um, oh my set shell. Okay. Hey, set shell with o oh my set sh yeah seashell shell, C -shell. Yeah. okay set thanks set shell yeah. it, it looked awesome um, <laughs> there, there were apparently significant changes between uh, px4 1.8 and 1.9 setl uh, setup can you maybe elaborate what were changes were because everything on my side everything broke and uh, I don't use in gazebo what, we have our own in what respect hmm in what respect broke? So first of all, the transport changed from UDP to TCP, Correct. and it actually expects, it doesn't bring the TCP server, it expects, it says listening on this TCP port, but it actually is talking to that port, and then it complains that, uh, after that problem is solved, it complains that uh, the sensor values are stale, even though it does receive them, so. Um, yeah, I, I probably can't, um, give you the solutions now for all the things that changed. Um, what I can see, say, yes, we went from UDP to TCP because with UDP potentially, if you run the simulation on one side and then PX4 on an, another host, you could lose on the, on the networking, you could lose packets. So we had to add TCP. Now, if that broke your simulation setup, which might be different, UDP is still an option. You can, you can, we, we didn't, delete UDP, so to say. So you can, with some setting options, go back to UDP. You can also go back to non-lockstep. So Is it the only two major things uh, that changed? Pardon? Lockstep and TCP is the only two major changes to your knowledge. 
There was also changes to the, the shell implementation, so how those things talk to each other. And there was many more changes that, that I'm probably not aware of right now. So okay, I guess thank look you. at the change log and the diff and approach me for anything with lockstep that you're stuck with, like to all of you. Um, that there have been several things coming up and every, every now and then I, my answer was you can try without lockstep, sort of go to the previous behavior um, or you can implement the new thing but it takes some, you need to make sure to adhere to, to the lockstepping otherwise it, you will just stall. Any more questions? No? Well, thank you Julian for your time. Sure. Next.